Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studio, it's time for Family Business Radio. Showcasing outstanding family businesses and the advisors who assist them. Welcome, you're listening to Family Business Radio. I am your host, Anthony Chen. Today, we have two amazing guests. We have Shell Hartzell with 360 Pests and Food Safety Consulting and Olivia Garza with Acton Academy in Alpharetta. So today, we'll, to kick us off the show, we have Shell. Shell, welcome to the show. Hi, it's fun to be here. Hey, thank you for coming. So kind of share with us a quick story as to what got you interested into the pest control business. Oh, gosh, that's a long story. Um, the, the short answer is completely accidentally. Um, I was an entomology uh, major in college. Uh, halfway through college, actually, I switched. And through a series of happy accidents, wound up in pest control. And it's just a fun ride. It's It's been an amazing journey to get here. And the problems I deal with and the pests that I deal with are, for a science geek like me, a little bit fun. Mm-hmm. So, so for those who are not in the know, etymology, is it a study of pests or a study of insects? Study of insects, yes. I don't think we have an actual ology for, for urban pests, but we, we should come up with one. Mm, certainly. So what kind of initially got you into the study of etymology, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, you know, I was always kind of sciencey as a kid. I liked being outdoors. I, I liked being out in nature. And after a couple years of college and not being quite happy where I was, kind of looked through and said, what can I do that still looks interesting? interesting and, you know, that I can do something with. And entomology was one of those things. And I just absolutely fell in love with my first entomology class and just the the diversity of all the insects out there and the biology of it and the ecology is just really incredible when you think of how much is out there from that, that entomology perspective. Mm-hmm. And from there, is that kind of where you charted your course going into the whole industry of pest control? Or did you take other paths before ending up into pest control? No, that, that was, in fact, I, I, I sort of remember back in, in college saying I would never work for a pest control company. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so went on to graduate school and actually did agricultural entomology for a little bit. Um, and then uh, worked for a zoo. Um, I supervised their entire entomology program at the zoo with all of their arthropods and did a little bit of work with uh, lizards and, and amphibians and all the cold-blooded stuff. Um, then went back into research, and that's kind of where it started. We started doing research onto product packaging. You would not believe how much research goes into the, the, the products and how they're packaged to make sure things can't get in. And from there, it kind of led me to the food industry. Food industry led to the the urban pest and pest control. So, so what you're telling me is that all the stuff that I'm buying at the grocery stores, someone like yourself actually went in behind the scenes to design the packaging. Yeah, it's amazing. except for flour. We still sell flour in paper bags, which is like the worst thing that you could do. But yeah, think of your granola bars and your cereal packaging and, and crackers and potato chips. All of that is very specifically designed in a lot of cases for a number of reasons, but pest proofing is one of those reasons. Mm-hmm. So, so kind of the f- f- for the lay person understanding in terms of pest control, so just kind of uh, from what you're describing, really, the tip of the iceberg is more than just spraying chemicals. From mm-hmm. the sound of it. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, when we think of residences of, of your house or your apartment um, where people live, it's really about looking at the whole system and why are pests getting in? What are they there for? What kind of foods are they after? And trying to minimize those conditions so we don't have pest problems. Um, think of the flies that might be outside. We want to keep them on the outside and not let them in. Same thing with termites. We don't want to give them that opportunity to attack the wood. We want to keep them farther away from structures. So a lot of pest control is actually preventative, and very little of it is the treatments and products. But when we get there, we have some really good tools that we can do in very targeted, specific ways to minimize risk. And from my understanding of your business, you're like the pest control for pest control companies. Kind of share with us, what does that look like? Yeah, so as an entomologist, as a as a bug geek, as I, I fondly refer to myself as, I work with pest control companies, mostly small and mid-sized companies that don't have a bug geek on staff, that don't have somebody technical that does the training that helps with the troubleshooting and the pest problems when they run into problems in the field. So I work for those small and mid-sized pest control companies as that fractional technical expert and training director for them on the scale that they need it. 
Mm-hmm. And then I noticed that you kind of going back to kind of the food industry with, with your experience with the packaging, and everything. What what is kind of the, the things that the listeners are coming into saying? Okay, well, I didn't know that there's this whole other field and research between the product design. Uh, what is something that you see as a very common mistake that you wish the public would know a little bit more of uh, behind your field? Oh, um, you know, kind of what you brought up earlier. A lot of people think that pest control is spraying a bunch of nasty chemicals. And it's really not. It's it's really about looking at that entire system and trying to solve some of those underlying problems because all living things, pests included, need food, water, and shelter. So they're there for a reason. Something has brought them in. So if we can minimize the food, if we can, you know, minimize the shelter and water in some cases, think of mosquitoes. If we can minimize some of those things, we can prevent those populations and prevent them from getting inside. So it really is that that whole look at the system and trying to solve those underlying conditions so that when we get to the stage that we have to use some products, it's pretty minimal. Mm. And then what about the constant need uh, under the restaurant business. I mean, they, that's like a 24-7 task. With them. I mean, cooking is one thing, but it's from my understanding, from people running the restaurant or any food business, is pest control is more or less the, another part-time job for them. It can be. I mean, nobody wants to walk into a restaurant and see rats running through the restaurant or flies flying around the bar. It's, mm-hmm. it's something that we just cannot have. So again, we can't eliminate all the food in a restaurant. How would you possibly do that? But we can look at the sanitation levels and we can minimize what's there. We can look at how we can prevent those pests from getting in in the first place and establishing. And when they do get in, we can respond really quickly so it doesn't get to those out of control proportions. We can target it, treat it when it's small and easy to deal with. So for a business, whether it's a restaurant or a food manufacturer, kind of looking towards a specialist like yourself coming into doing an audit would be best as prior to opening as you're doing a blueprint. Maybe uh, maybe I'm pe- uh, painting a very idealistic picture of things here is that when they're designing their business architecture-wise would it be best to have you on staff or would it be you coming in after the fact and then look at maybe patches to fix up? Well, just like pest control, we want it to be as preventative as possible. It would always be great if we could get called in at the very first step so we can look at some of those things from that pest control standpoint, from that viewpoint. Um, Unfortunately, that doesn't happen a lot. Um, So we usually get called in afterwards. But there's still a lot of things that we can do post-construction or post-issue to reset things, get things back to where they should be, and prevent future problems. Well, with the summer uh, coming right around the corner, uh, what is the top major pest that people should be aware about and what can they do in terms of mitigating? Uh, For residential, for homeowners, it's definitely going to be ticks this year. Ticks are all in the news. And we have to be really concerned with ticks because not only Lyme disease, which is huge in the Northeast, but um, something called alpha-gal syndrome, which if there's any vegetarians out there, that's great. But if you don't want to be a vegetarian, alpha-gal syndrome can give you a highly allergic reaction to meat forever Mm -hmm. um, from one single tick bite. Um, So that's scary, especially if you don't voluntarily want to be a vegetarian. And there's a bunch of other diseases that ticks carry. So definitely from a residential standpoint, we want to be really concerned about those ticks, making sure you're you're protecting your yard and protecting yourself. For businesses, um, a lot of it is cockroaches. This year, I think, is going to be big for cockroaches. So we want to prevent the ones that are outside. And if any do get in, we want to respond really quickly so we can keep those things small and manageable when they do get in. Well, it's funny that you mentioned ticks because kind of a well, me being a hiker or outdoors, but it was always always the perception that ticks were more of a, an issue to the northeast mm-hmm. area. Are they, they just coming further south now, or has that always been an issue and it's only been, been recent because of the diseases uh, coming in? Yeah, so we have a number of species of ticks all across the U.S. So no matter where you are, you have ticks. Mm. It's just what diseases they're carrying. And we've definitely seen the spread of the alpha-gal syndrome. We're seeing the spread of Lyme disease that's coming out of the Northeast. Um, we've got Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever that pops up here and there. The CDC has a great website that wherever you live, you can kind of type that in and they'll show you what the risk is for your area. So I highly encourage people to visit the CDC website on ticks. Mm -hmm. So other than visiting the CDC website on on ticks itself, 
for for those who are more into outdoors. Now, now I'm a little selfish here. <laughs> is okay. Well, so what what should someone listener like myself do to help mitigate the, the risk of being bitten or exposed to ticks? Yeah, when you're outside your house, definitely wear your PPE. Um, again, the CDC recommends certain. Um, insect repellents, which includes the the tick repellents. So make sure you're wearing something with DEET or one of the other CDC approved tick sprays, bug sprays, if you will. Um, for your yard, you know, keep the vegetation trimmed back a little. The ticks like that longer grass, that kind of scruffy area. That's where they like to be. So if you kind of keep things a little bit well-maintained, maybe do some targeted treatments towards the back and sides of your yards where they're they, there is that more brushy area. You can keep those tick populations down. Mm-hmm. Great. Then in terms of having your experience dealing with all kinds of pets, can you share with kind of some unique Oku stories uh, dealing with them? Oh, gosh, I've dealt with some amazing accounts. Uh, I deal with a lot of museums and zoos because they're they're very special. You know, we obviously have million dollar pieces of art that what, what do we do? <laughs> and zoos where we have animals that we want to keep alive and healthy while some of the rest of them we want to minimize. So being in those specialized accounts where you're limited on what you can do and getting creative with the tools that you have to solve pest problems and prevent pest problems. Um, I dealt with a very large museum in New York City that was having an issue with mice um, and keeping the mice out of very sensitive areas with priceless artifacts um was was a challenge but we managed to implement some really good systems and get that taken care of for them now i'm a little curious as what would mice want to do with (laughs) artifacts so this particular museum um was a very large one um they had cafes and they had food Uh, in there but also when you think of art i mean a lot of people think of art as just paintings but there's a lot of multimedia pieces of art there's older things that have grains and you know flowers and dried fruits and nuts and stuff like that that rodents can do and and rodents like to chew so they're just going to chew on stuff whether they eat it or not so we have the damage that way too that they can provide mm-hmm. right. well other than now i'm looking at your tr- understanding uh all of the fields or business that you can certainly help with now let's say a business that are business that's listening as a well i'm not in food or food manufacturing and i'm not dealing with artifacts that has flour or grain mm-hmm. as part of the ingredient uh, 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 of the art piece why should i be more concerned uh, about pests Yeah, if you're in any of the industries that you deal with other humans, basically, so anything dealing with food, hospitality, healthcare, any industry that you want to walk into their business and not see pests, that's when, you know, I can step in and and provide that independent assessment. We think of hospitals and healthcare facilities. You don't want a bunch of flies around there. You think of hospitality. Who wants to walk into a room and have bed bugs in Mm -hmm. their hotel room? There's a lot of industries that are very high risk to pest, and we want to help them prevent those pests and solve those pest issues quickly when they do pop up. Mm, great. So as one part of your service, you talk a lot about prevention and, and getting in there before it even becomes a problem. Yeah. Well, for someone that's listening in now, it's like, okay, that's great and all, but I got a fire now. Yep. <laughs> what can, is there something that you can do to, to come in and kind of fix things up? Absolutely. Um, So I've had over a decade in the industry, so I've seen lots of different accounts, lots of different problems. And going in with the the science background that I have and the viewpoint that I have can usually identify the problem pretty quickly. We can search out those underlying conditions that are prolonging it and give them really good methods moving forward to stop that from happening, get that population under control, get it eliminated, and then those preventative measures moving forward. Mm -hmm. Well, now for, for a couple of questions that are a little bit more, uh, I guess, geographic specific here in Georgia. I think it was last year now, the name kind of escapes me. There is a non-native spider mm-hmm. that kind of blew up around here in, in the southeast. Uh, can you kind of share with with the audience, is that something to be of concern about? Is that something you need to immediately get rid of? Or they're just kind of a, a predator to kind of help us get rid of some of these other bugs and pests? Yeah. Um, so it's the Juro spider. It's native to Asia. And it did show up about actually five or six years ago in Georgia. But last year was a huge year for it. I had them all over my house. You know what I didn't have around my house? I didn't have mosquitoes last year. Hmm. 
imagine that? Um, I love spiders. Spiders are great predators, but we want to keep them on the outside and we don't want their populations to be excessive. I mean, nobody likes walking through spider webs. Um, so for the Juro spider in, in specific, I haven't seen any yet this year um, compared to the numbers that we saw last year. So we have no idea how that's going to turn out. But once you see spider webs starting to pop up, the best thing you can do is just start knocking them down. Spiders like to be in, in areas that are undisturbed. They want to catch their bugs and move on. So if you keep knocking down their webs, they're, they sit there and go, this is not a good place for me. I got to be somewhere else. Um, so it disturbs their area. And you can keep those populations down, move them just a little bit farther out just by knocking down their webs. Mm-hmm. Okay. Great. And then uh, at the very beginning, you touched a little bit about agriculture-based pest control. Yeah. Now, the first thing that comes to mind is just like farmers. Uh, yep. Is there something uh, else beyond just that very surface level of understanding? Um, so I worked in soybeans when I was a grad student. So we have a lot of different crops and a lot of different pests that attack that. My main focus is after that's been harvested. So from that initial harvest stage up through you know processing distribution and then you know as it gets to its end user. Mm-hmm. Um, the agricultural field, um, especially with entomology, is huge. There's a lot going on there. Um, I admit it is not my field of expertise anymore mm-hmm. great well thank you uh, so much for sharing now uh for our listeners that are kind of listening to this whole world of um i'm sorry what was entomology entomology <laughs> uh and getting a, a better grasp of all the things involved even down to the product design and packaging yeah uh how can they best reach in and find you? Yeah, it's pretty easy to find me. I am on the web at shellhartzer.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, if you go to my website, shellhartzer.com, you can find my email, phone number, and all additional contact information. Great. Thank you. And our next guest coming up is Olivia. Olivia, welcome to the show. Hi, Anthony. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So, Olivia, kind of share with us a story as to what got you to decide to uh, open up Acton Academy. Well, just as Shell, it was a long process. Um, I had always um, knew my children weren't going to take the traditional route of schooling and decided to homeschool them. And then we did uh, various uh, hybrid programs where they would be in a couple of days a week and then um, homeschool at home. And at one point, I just saw the love of learning um, diminishing in their eyes, and I wanted to uh, find a new route. And we moved it over to homeschooling 100%, and I came across Acton Academy one day and fell in love with the first thing I found. I watched some videos, uh, started reading um, everything I could find about it, uh, all the different blogs, all the different, uh, there were TED Talks about it. There was so much information out there that um, I dove in and clicked the button, launch your school, and never looked back. So it was it was a day that just changed everything. It was an amazing, um, amazing opportunity to find that. And it just has really been the solution mm-hmm. for education that I've been looking for for my kids. Oh. So kind of addressing the, the, the elephant in the room then is that we have, there's a lot of parents in terms of kind of shifting or moving away from kind of the public school model wanting to have a bit more say or control in terms of the quality of the education for their students. Because you brushed a little bit about how their curiosity is mm-hmm. kind of waning in mm-hmm. the system. Mm-hmm. Um, other than kind of other private schools or maybe the, the, the dinosaur in the room or the big elephant is the Montessori schools. Well, what is it that makes Acton Academy unique? Um. In about every way possible, it is different from a traditional model. Uh, there, it is a learner-driven environment. That is the the primary difference. Is that this is not a school where teachers stand in front of a whiteboard. Um, they're teaching the children all day. They are teaching to um, different curriculums that are provided from them above. You know, and that they don't have a lot of control over. Mm-hmm. This is a school that allows the learners to. Um, be self-directed and they get to work at their own paces, but at the same time they build a tribe and they work together collaboratively and they do projects together and they do hard work and they have a lot of systems they follow to be able to uh, unite as a group. And the guides are, um, we don't have teachers, we have guides. So the guides are the ones that kind of help facilitate some of the big projects they do. And they lead Socratic questions and discussions every day um, to really develop that critical thinking and, um, the communication skills and there's the number of moments throughout the day that they work together and that they are, they have to be independent on their own, but then they also have to um, be able to come together as a tribe. It's, it's just not a typical traditional model. And the fact that it is not driven by an adult, it, there is no top down. The, the 
learners are the, actually the ones that run the school and they make the decisions um, and they are the ones that actually come together and create the studios and, and it's theirs. It's their studio, not ours. Mm. Uh, I, I noticed that you mentioned that you don't have teachers, you, you have guides and, and kind of where the class curriculum is not on a top down, but it sounds like it's very much where the students are picking their path mm-hmm. And the guys were there, and you touch a little bit as uh, the Socratic method is really helping them understand questioning or learn how to question. Is that kind of the gist of it? Yes, exactly. It's mm-hmm. exactly right. They are learning both. They're learning. Our guides are never allowed to answer questions. That is one um, kind of caveat with our school. Um, so they are never allowed to answer questions. So the the learners slowly realize that you know they're going to come to a guide, but they're not going to get an answer. So they learn to do research or figure out how they can solve the answer and figure it out on their own, or they go to a peer. Um, we have mixed age studios so that there's uh, three to four age um, years of difference in the studio. So they are working together with older and younger learners um, in each group. And so, yeah, they learn to ask good questions, but then they're also learning to be able to critically think and respond and communicate answers back. So for our listeners that are, that are uh, getting this exposure for the first time, because traditionally, we're, uh, even for myself, being brought through the public uh, school system, I mean, the tradition is that you have one teacher in the front, whether with a whiteboard or back then it was a chalk or a blackboard. Uh, what does it look like when this structure as, as a one day of class, if, if that's the proper term, one day of class or maybe questioning session uh, at your academy? Sure. Um, well, we start in the morning. They have about 30 minutes before as all the learners are arriving and they are able to um, kind of collaborate, work on projects, read, do games, anything that they want to do. They come together all at nine o'clock. We have a schedule that is posted and the learners follow that on their own. There are no bells that ring. Um, there's no one. The guides aren't you know, supposed to come in and say, OK, it's time to move to this transition to this next project. Um, they are on their own for as far as following the schedule. So they do a little countdown at nine o'clock and they come together and they sit down and do a gratitude circle They'll talk about something they're grateful for, and then our guide will come in and lead a Socratic discussion. Um, That takes usually a few minutes in the morning, and then they'll sit down and um, complete that conversation, and then they move into um, uh, group group discussions with peers, and they're called running partners. And those partners are actually kind of like accountability partners, so they're helping make sure they're setting challenging goals, but um, not, you know, if they have any struggles, if they're having any accomplishments, these are the people that they share them with on a daily basis. So they're kind of helping each other navigate and move through the day. Um, Then they all will move after they've set their goals. We set SMART goals every day. And once they do that, they will move into their core skills time where they're working on math, reading, um, some writing, different types of grammar. Um, We have all types of different adaptive programs and technologies that they use. And then once they've completed that, they'll usually do a writer's type workshop and they work together in different projects. Um, And again, this is, they are following the schedule and they're just moving from event to event. There are times that our guides will go in and actually launch a new workshop that's going to be some kind of fun writing project they're going to be doing. And then after that, they'll move in and they'll have a normal lunch and recess time frame. But then they come in after that and they kind of have a little downtime and do deer, which is drop everything and read, um, where they'll come in and they choose a book of their choice. There's no mandated books. They're able to choose whatever is interesting to them to read. And then they will um, complete that part of the day. And then they move into the quest. And that's kind of what really separates Acton is we have um, about six, seven sessions every year. And each one is a different quest project. So they're hands-on, real-world um learning opportunities for them to come in and learn everything from, you know, it could be robotics to science and gardening to um, crime labs that it's, it's a whole gamut and a rotation that is a lot of fun for them. So that's a lot of hands-on um, that's their afternoons. And then they all work together. The guides will usually do a launch to set the quest project off for the day. And then they're on their own and they run with whatever their goals are for that day for the project. And then they'll come together and they do studio maintenance and they're in charge of keeping the studio clean as well. So if you come in our studio about two forty-five, you'll see people mopping and the learners will be mopping and dusting and cleaning and taking the trash out. And they manage the entire um, studio as far as cleanliness. And then they come together and do a little closing launch and talk about their accomplishments for the day, um, do any character call outs, that type of thing. And then they close and they're out the door. So it's just a really fun collaborative um, day every day every day is fun they don't usually want to go home 
Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, and, and, and what grades or, or years do, do you serve? Mm -hmm. We are six through middle school right now, six years old through middle school, and we are looking to um, move forward with high school next year. So. Yeah, okay, because I'm just going to say, uh, for all the, the, the parents are listening, you know, wait, you, you get your kids to clean up the place? Can, mm -hmm. can you get them to do it for our place too? <laughs> we hear that a lot. And, and it does work, and then there's sometimes it doesn't so work. They are kids, but they, it's amazing watching them take that responsibility for this studio that they do feel ownership over. Mm, wow. So for the listeners that are being exposed to this idea, this concept for the first time, how do they know, or rather, what are the signs you look for to – figure out which families or what kind of kids would be a best fit for this kind of academy? Mm -hmm. Well, we want families that will embrace failure and experience as learning opportunities. Um, that's probably the number one. Um, we definitely encourage uh, families to definitely don't remove obstacles, um, help them struggle, help them get through challenging times and don't, don't just keep it, um, take it off to the point where they are making it easier on them. Uh, in any way that they possibly can. If we really seem to always kind of gravitate towards attracting entrepreneurial mindset families um, and, and growth mindset families that really understand the hard work and that they understand um, that failure is nothing but a learning opportunity. And that's usually um, those families are the ones that are excited and they, they can trust the process. And they know that if you step back as an adult, the, the learners can do amazing things. Yeah, trusting the process. Uh, I know you won't say you're, you're very nice about it, so I'll I'll be the bad cop. Mm -hmm. If um, understand you correctly, is that you don't want helicopter parenting? Oh, that is not going to work in our school. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. So, what advice would you give uh, to families that are kind of interested but they're not really sure how to get started? Because this is all very new. Okay, you're telling me that my kids are not exactly being taught what to do. There's just no tradition additional one teacher per se at the front or the blackboard and, and kind of a class course curriculum. And from everything you're kind of sharing is like a project to project basis. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess one major thing that will kind of highlight to the parents' eyes is, okay, well, how do I know they're going to be able to achieve on standardized testing scores? Mm -hmm. And they will. The, we, um, we don't, like I said, we don't have teachers, but we also don't have grades. Um, we are a badge-based school more, so and we um, focus on mastery versus grades. So we want to ensure that they have truly mastered a topic, um, subject, skill, whatever it is that they're working on, versus kind of knowing it with a 72 and being able to move forward. They're going to actually know it full on. Um, so once... As a mastery-based program, they have to complete – there is a um, the curriculums that they have that we will work with, and they have all of the same grammar-type skills and the reading, arithmetic, um, math, writing. All of those types of skills are still there. They have to – they have them on adaptive technologies. They work on a day-to-day -day basis that will actually give them an opportunity to move at their own pace so that they can – move as quickly as they need, but there's opportunities for the families to actually go in and look on different tracking systems to be able to see what type of goals they're setting, where their learners struggling. They can check that throughout the entire year to be able to see the progress. Um, they also get to come in at the end of every session and they will get to do a visit to the studio for our exhibitions. Um, so they come in and a lot of times we'll get to see the learning that has been happening with the projects, but also they get to see whether they do it on a day-to-day -day basis. What are some of the writings they've been working on? What are the different things? So they can see and track that throughout the entire year. But then we also, our particular school in Alpharetta, we do do um, testing at the end of the year so they can see a year-over-year -year growth as well. Mm. Wow. And I know on the side, uh, we, we mentioned, uh, talked briefly offline is regarding to the entrepreneurial mindset that are being taught to the students, but also there's kind of a, a workshop or convention per se where it's specifically student ideas and businesses where they can more or less uh, showcase their services, their products, can you explain it or, or kind of showcase to our listeners like what that is all about? Yeah. So every every year we have a, it's called eShip Quest, and that's where the learners get to come in and they learn about all the different aspects of building a business at their level. Um, they're learning about even sim all the way down to simple business plans, um, to marketing, logo design, uh, taking surveys, and what do what their customers want? What are they looking for? What is something that they would prefer? Pink lemonade versus yellow lemonade, you know, all the way down to um, – that type of questioning. And then they get an opportunity to actually budget and they'll have a, a budget that they have to work with. They'll have to do some research to figure out what they can 
um, buy, purchase, make for their exhibition that they're going to be doing as they're building this business, which is the exhibition will be to showcase the the final products of their business, whatever it is that they're opening, whether it's a product they're selling or a service. Um, so they will work together um, and they get an opportunity to really uh, explore every gamut of a building the businesses or building all of their businesses on a high level. Um, and then they get to come in at the parents will come in at the exhibition and they will have an opportunity to come and buy. Um, they actually handle real money. They're having to make change. Um, they had to price their products to where the parents would actually want to spend money to, um, you know, on those products. It's just a, it's a great opportunity for the kids to be able to come in and um, experience every facet you can imagine, it, you know, at a learner a younger learner business space. Mm-hmm. Okay, so for listeners coming in, okay, so you're, you're telling me that the there won't be teachers, there'll be guides that'll help mm-hmm. them understand, or rather, as your word, master the subject rather than just getting a 70, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with this, uh, plus being able to, or rather being taught how to question or having that critical cur- mindset and curiosity and then very lastly maybe some of the parents are still already uh, more zoned in on wait you can get my kids to clean my place for me now so <laughs> for those that are listening in um how can they get involved with an acting academy or or how for example if there is none in their local area how can they still be involved sure um well, I highly encourage if there's not an act in your area and it's something that you're extremely passionate about. And once you find out and do a deep dive into the program and the methodology, mm-hmm. if there's any possible way to open one, it's the best decision you could ever make. It won't be easy always, but it will be great. Um, take your kids along with the journey, watch them build this business. And um, it was, it, it's an experience to, to live for. I mean, it's been an amazing experience for my family and my children. Um, but if it's not, I think there's so many different ways Um you can definitely, I think the, the, the most important thing you can do is just really create and hone a love for learning with your learners or your children. Um, but also show your children that your family as a whole loves to learn and model learning um, as parents with them and share with them and their children why you love learning and what you want to learn and, and encourage them. Don't, don't panic if um, your daughter is a little behind in math or if your son is a little behind in reading or not reading as, as much as the neighbor kid is. Um, just figure out a way you can make learning a game um, that they want to play where learning becomes fun and exciting and it's also challenging at the same time. Um, and I, I think really if you, you know, acting is very, um, you know, our mission is that every child that walks into our doors is a hero and a genius and they are here and they will find their passions to find a calling and change the world. So what are your child's passions? What are your child's interests? Um, what can you do and what do they do great just naturally? And how can you hone in on that? What can you do um, to help them learn and chart new territories to explore where their interests are? And um, just honoring that and, and helping them grow in the areas that they really enjoy and love um, is the most, the most important thing I think as you raise your child. Okay, well, well, thank you so much. Uh, for those that are listening that are at least going to be local here in Alpharetta uh, or North Fulton area, how can they best find you to get involved themselves and get their kids enrolled? Sure, yeah. Um, there are several Actons all around the greater Atlanta area. Our particular Acton is in Alpharetta. We're just north of um, downtown Alpharetta. You can find us on uh, Facebook at Acton Academy Alpharetta and Instagram at Acton Academy Alpharetta as well. Um, and then our website is just actonalpharetta.com. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. So as you can hear, uh, based on today's uh, guess, a lot of the theme revolves around passion, uh, infinite curiosity, uh, whether it be curiosity of pests and bugs or curiosity in terms of learning and passing that torch on of always asking, having that drive of curiosity moving forward. Um, for one or two questions, I would like to bring our guests back uh, at the later half uh, of the podcast is, if we could turn back the hands of time and you were to give yourself an advice as you're nurturing your own curiosity, what advice would you give to your younger self? That's the first question. And then the second would be for those that are listening in, being exposed for the first time that there's another option rather than just being following a, a chart or a path that everyone else is following or maybe someone prescribed that path for them and they're on the fence of wanting to chase their own passion what advice would you give them? So again, the two question is, what would you give 
advice for your younger self as you're going through this journey? And then what advice would you give to someone that's listening in who haven't really taken that leap of faith in chasing their passion? So this comes to the legalese portion of the show. Uh, the show is sponsored and brought to you uh, by myself, Anthony Chen, with Lighthouse Financial Network. Securities and advisory services offered through Royal Alliance Associates, Inc., RAA, member FINRA, SIPC. RAA is separately owned and other entities and or marketing names, products, or services referenced here are independent of RAA. Our main office address is at 575 Broad Hollow Road in Melville, New York, 11747. You can best reach me at 631 631- Four six five nine zero nine zero, extension five zero seven five, or my email, which is just my phone name, Anthony Chen C H E N at l f n l l c dot com. Now to kind of bring our guests back, Shell, leading off with you. All right, what advice would I give my younger self? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I'd say just keep going. Um, There's a lot of ups and downs, and my path has not been a straight one, and that's been fun. Um, It doesn't have to be a straight path. It doesn't have to be what you planned out when you were six years old. So just keep going. Keep riding those waves and ride the ups and downs because it's a fantastic journey. And for those uh, looking to get into something new, something different, reach out to somebody uh, who you think is interesting and have a coffee chat with them, have a virtual coffee or something, and just find out a little bit more and see if that's something that you want to do. Um, you know, being curious about it and getting more information is a great place to start. Great. Thank you. Olivia. Yeah, thank you. Um I agree with uh, Shell. The um, I think keeping on going is it's huge. Um, and you know, as a child, I look back. I think I had um, a lot of uh, desires that I just felt like staying mainstream would have been the safe route to take. And I think taking risk and having confidence and and understanding how much you learn from failure as a younger person would have been you know a great lesson to understand more. And I think so. Just don't be afraid of failure and and take off and give it a shot. And if it doesn't work, try it again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And then as far as um, someone that is looking uh, it's very similar, I think staying curious truly and, and just always doing whatever you can to research, find out more, find a ment- mentor or a coach, um, look for someone that could help you learn more about the area that you're interested in and just don't be afraid, just do it because the strength of the unknown will really push the mission. I would believe that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now for a little uh, section called Anthony's Financial Take. Uh, I know in the past, uh, prior, I've spoken a lot uh, regarding to clients' own individual passions and chasing what means to them uh, in terms of a retirement lifestyle. Uh, we're going to change a little bit up today uh, since a lot of the conversation revolve uh, around our youth and education itself and starting early. Uh, I know for a lot of parents, uh, probably especially young families nowadays have kind of student loans uh, hanging above their heads and their biggest concern is, well, okay, I've got this loan above my head. How do I best afford for my kid's education? Well, kind of uh, going with the theme of today's conversation is really thinking out of the box and more or less nurturing their passions and nurturing that kind of curiosity. Sometimes the traditional path of just a four-year college and doing this and that just because everyone else is doing it is not exactly... uh, your child's passion, perhaps you might find that they're, they have a passion in bugs or, or something else that you might not even have even considered. There's a whole field of industry and need uh, and specialty around it. So be a little adventurous when doing financial planning. Don't just look at college planning for your child. Look at their career planning or more or less, actually a better phrase would be their passion planning. Because for all we know, that might be a whole different field and line of business, and you're not going to get that new field or industry on some diploma. So that's a little bit of my my take. Don't look at college financial planning. Look at your child's passion planning. And that's my take. It's Anthony Chen with Lionel's Financial, and you've been listening to Family Business Radio. (laughs) 